I am Brad Keeler. They are Philip and Elaine Gallet. Coming up next on our second very special Father's Day Director's Cut. Find out if they've ever worked on any projects together and what that was like. Feel it, see it, hear it today. If you can't, then it doesn't matter anyway. You will never understand it because it happens too fast. And it feels so good, it's like walking the glass. It's so cool, so hip, it's all right. It's so groovy, it's out of sight. You can touch it. Hello again, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Director's Cut. My name is Brad Keeler. I'm the director of the Geo Institute, and that is why we call this show Director's Cut. Every single week, I sit down with a different GI member who has stories to tell. Some of them are personal, some of them are professional, but all of them are fun. If you aren't familiar with the Geo Institute, after you get done watching this interview today, you should head over to geoinstitute.org, and there you will find out that we are a technical society with about 12,000 members, most of whom are geotechnical engineers and or geologists, and we are part of the American Society of Civil Engineers. If you like what you see today, and you're going to, we'll tell you why in a minute, you should click like, subscribe, and get notifications, and we will let you know every time we post something to the YouTube channel. Now, I said I sit down with a different GI member. Today, we have two in front of you, and this is the second director's cut of the week, which may have thrown some of you off. It's because this is a very special Father's Day episode, so we are featuring one of our all-star father and son combos from within the Geo Institute membership. <laughs> father, Elaine Gallet from Terracon. Son, Philip Gallet from Morris Shea. Guys, we're going to have a good time today. We have 10 questions, the same as we do every week. And two of those are the same that we ask everybody. We start with one of those. Describe your job in 45 seconds. And we'll we'll go with the elder statesman of the family here to start. Elaine, you're up first. Well, my current job. Again, thanks. appreciate the offer and appreciate being here. Well, my current job now with Terracon uh, I manage uh, national clients. Uh, I've been in a business for uh, close to 50 years and I uh, joined uh, Terracon. They acquired my company uh, in, nine, in 2009, 2000, oh, 2009, about four, almost 14 years ago. Uh, and since then, I've been with them and uh, worked in different area. Uh, one area, and we'll talk a little bit later on, is uh, as director of the energy sector. But now what I do is I've got a uh, handful of national clients that I've worked with all my my entire career that just won't forget my phone number. So I uh, they call me, I'm their for, point of contact, and I help them get their projects done through the network, uh, Terracon's network of offices. We have 165 offices coast to coast. So all you have to do is make one phone call and I do the rest and then bring the proposal to their table and then they sign up work and we go to work. So that's what I do now. Uh, I do it out of my home and uh, 90% of the time or in my RV when I'm traveling. So it's on, on my own terms with my clients uh, uh, agreement. They, they know where to get a hold of me. They got my cell number so they can reach me wherever, wherever I am. I actually got a Starlink satellite that I hooked up on my RV. So I've got, I got Wi-Fi anywhere I go and I'm in business. And you've already earned yourself a follow-up question. We didn't even make it to Philip's first question yet. What's what's the best and the worst part of working out of the RV? Because I have to imagine that it's incredibly freeing, but at the same time, there are probably some challenges. No, actually, it's pretty great. I, my wife is not; it's, she's a late sleeper, so I get up early in the morning, and I'll crank up my computer, and uh, by nine o'clock, nine thirty, I've usually taken care of all my clients' issues and. Uh, we go to we go wherever we want to go in our destination in the afternoon. I, I crank it back up and uh, take care of any follow up calls. So it, I, 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 mobile office works great, especially when you've got uh, Starlink uh, antenna following you. You can uh, yeah, access to Wi-Fi anywhere you go. That's great. Philip, now what about you? 45 seconds, your job. Well, as my. Uh... My uncle, I think, affectionately called it. I'm on the dark side of the geotechnical world, so I'm a contractor, right? Or I work for a contractor. And 
I I meet clients. So it's kind of the face to face, the front end of projects so that I can figure out what's the most efficient way to do the job and really kind of <laughs> how I like to think about it is kind of like a geotechnical construction arbitrage, figure out what is currently being designed. And then is there something we can do that's more efficient, faster, cheaper, better um, so that we can provide that value to the clients? So, um, yeah, that's uh, the quick and dirty of it, Brad. I like that. And we're going to start with you on the second question. Now, the fun okay. questions are the meat and potatoes of director's cut. This is <laughs> why the people watch. What food is your biggest weakness? I actually have two. So I know you want one. Sorry. Uh, oh, no, sour yeah, but kids, if there's two, you got to sure, go both. This, so sour director's Patch cut is are, as it's heart, <laughs> at its heart. Food, sports, and music, right? That's what we do. That's <laughs> true. Um, sour Patch Kids? are definitely a weakness of mine, but then also homemade brownies, like a homemade brownie that I made on uh, the green egg, like a smoked brownie. Whoa. I can't, I can't put that away. Like, no, you can't turn that down. Okay. How did you start with the smoked brownies? Like, cause that's, it, you don't just accidentally do that. No, right? no, 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 no. Um, so the, fraternity I was a part of in college that all the guys got together on my um when I got married and they bought me a big green egg and with that came the big green egg cookbook and that's where the smoked brownies came from and so I think everything that thing makes it's not me everything that grill makes is delicious <laughs> I like that a lot that, oh that's fantastic <laughs> Alain what about you what's your biggest food weakness my food weakness is uh, pasta and bread I, I I'm a pasta man and I love bread, so especially French bread. I'm I just uh, that's my weakness. What about do you ever have anybody, maybe someone near and dear to you, maybe someone related to you by marriage, who tells you you can't have pasta and bread at the same meal? Have you ever heard that? And what do you say in response? That's not a meal. If you don't have the bread to go with the pasta. You don't have a meal. Thank you. And, this is and, and, how do you sop up the sauce? Yeah, this, you got this to is have... a huge thing in our house. Is like that we we have too many carbs. We can't have multiple carbs because I'll make a lot of Greek food, right? And even then, you got sometimes you have potatoes and bread, but you have to have that. It's totally yeah. appropriate together. Well, the French the French heritage, you know, gotta have that sauce and you gotta have that bread. Uh, it's Director's cut has helped me in so many ways with my marriage, guys. <laughs> and so I, I really appreciate this one. We we got we got the solution to the double carb problem knocked out today. So the third question is always the research and practice question. We've got some good ones today, and I uh, really appreciated talking about this before we recorded. Elaine, we're going to start with you. And, and you're going to talk a little bit about standards and protocols for renewables. And th this is cool. We haven't talked about this in a while. So that's all I'm going to say. I'm going to let you go. This is something that you said you've worked on for probably about the last decade. Yeah. Uh, when I joined uh, or emerged or Terracon acquired my company, uh, we did a lot of utility work. Well, Terracon was just at the infancy on doing utility work. Uh, so I became a the national director for the energy sector and the energy one of the big things that was getting started was renewable uh both renewable solar and wind and we uh jumped in there with both feet and one of the things we found out in the design of uh, solar fields and solar panels the practice out there really was going out there and driving uh in effect uh fence uh i would call them uh yeah little uh, six eight foot long uh guardrail fences in the ground, uh, eight feet, and then putting solar power on top of it and calling it good. And they had no protocol, no ideas, really, in our opinion, as designers on, on what they needed. So we came up with a different techniques. We actually worked up with a, a tripod uh, system to do pull-out tests. Uh, we we it, uh, came up with systems to load the, the the piles uh, for vertical loading. So it, we did a lot of infield testing that before wasn't being done. And what was being done was they would uh, take a load sale and they would 
tie it to the back of a backhoe and kind of yank it one way or yank it the other way with no, no, no protocols, no guidelines, no standard to follow. And we wanted to go back to the old ESTM standards for pull test and down and, and power load test and so on and so forth. So we came up with a system to have a consistent method so that it can be reproducible from pile to pile to pile to pile. Uh, and uh, so that was really, that was pretty cool. And uh, we wrote some procedures and now it's pretty well known in the industry how, how, to, how to do that. Now I gotta ask about this because so many of these installations I think this is probably true for the the windmills too, right? Are in desert areas where one, you're dealing with extremely sandy soils and two, very, very high winds. Like what's the most extreme environment that you guys saw for any of these installations? And maybe that's what kicked you guys into into gear, getting some of this stuff written. No, we, we see all sort of soils, uh, sands, and actually the biggest obstacle for solar is, is shallow rock, is shallow refusal. Because uh, if they can't drive the piles at least a minimum distance to get the, to get the friction for uplift, uh, the, yeah. the primary criteria is uplift. So those those sails basically that you, you're building over there, I mean sail, S-A-I-L-E, not sails in terms mm -hmm. of solar sails, because that's really what you're doing. That When the wind blows in the middle of the desert uh, in Texas, in, uh, in Colorado, in uh, Arizona, it blows. And it blows at 30, 40 miles an hour because it's, the solar panels will be underground and the windmills will be up in the air catching that wind. So you've got to have uplift resistance. And we were not seeing uh something we felt comfortable about design they, matter of fact the first few jobs we we were very reluctant about taking them because we didn't like what they wanted us to do so we had to come up we had a, a at least one guy on on our team was very uh joe that was joe's last name he passed away uh, so uh, oh, waxy. he was uh, joe waxy Joe Waxy was very active in GI at the, the Geo Institute. He he was on the team to come up with that uh, system, and uh, it's. But we got extreme winds, extreme heat, uh, and you, you know some of the solar fields will work. It's incredible. It's two thousand, three thousand, four thousand acres. Uh, so you have to evaluate uh, to do the work. So it's 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 pretty pretty neat stuff. And we're going to stick with a desert theme here, Philip. Your project was a sinkhole in New Mexico. T tell us the tale. Yeah, sure. So the um, project that we got brought into was, was called the Carlsbad Cavity. If you look it up, or the INW Brine Well. So what it was was a, a brine well, shallow, shallow brine well, just south of the city of Carlsbad. And um, in that same geology, they had another, I think there's three other wells that were shallow, same geology, and two of them had already collapsed, giant sinkholes. And so this is the one that hadn't collapsed yet. In 2008, I believe it was um, Amec Foster Wheeler got brought in to kind of do analysis and figure out, okay, what's going to happen? What's happening here? And then the whole project to prevent a sinkhole from occurring uh, started, kicked off in 2018. We bid in 2017, ran the project 2018 uh, or 2019 actually, and then we ran it through COVID, which was another uh, crazy thing. But yeah, it was pumped 200,000 cubic yards uh, into a pressurized void. So you had to make sure you keep the pressure so the roof doesn't collapse, yeah. but keep the volume the same. So volume in, volume out. And uh, we were actually foaming up sand. It was the most efficient way of doing it. So using cellular foam, fluff up the sand, pump it down the well, and then every couple hours it'd turn off to bleed off the air pressure. Um, but it was a it was a really cool job. And were you down there on the site? Because I always think sinkholes scare the crap out of people. Like, I don't think there's any other way to put it. I mean, out here where, where I live near DC, we had a huge one near Johns Hopkins University several years ago. And urban sinkholes are terrifying for other reasons. You know, they swallow an entire block full of parked cars or a whole building or whatever. This one was in a more isolated area. I mean, so what unique I don't know what other way to say it. What unique fears were there around this one? 
so when we first got down there, when we were all bidding the job, all the different contractors, um, again, AMEC Foster Wheeler, they were still AMEC at that point, had installed a bunch of geophysics around there. So they guaranteed us that they're monitoring everything and it's okay. Because that was the concern. Like we're out on top of a site that we know there's a, yeah. well, at that point, we weren't sure how big it was, uh, but we know there's a void underneath the surface um, of, oh man. I can't remember how many they, they told us how much brine they got out of it it was significant um and so it was like all right well we know there's a void here they they swore that they could uh the um uh, geophysics they had on the site was so sensitive they could even see us walking on the site so it's like okay well we'll know before it collapses we think so, yeah that was the that was the concern and you know the the originally the roof was thought to be about 300 i think 250 or 300 feet from the surface uh turned out actually directly underneath the highway the roof was closer to 125 150 feet uh from the surface so there's a lot of things that uh we we didn't know we didn't find out until we were uh we just started drilling it's kind of kind of weird how salt works right geophysics works really good but salt is a really uh interesting geology that doesn't doesn't give you a lot of info Oh man, that I, I loved the beginning of your story there where don't worry, everything's cool. We we're sure of that, but we don't know exactly how big this sinkhole is. That that was my favorite contrast right there. <laughs> so both of you talked a little bit about field work there. We are coming up to, or it is summer, I guess, depending on where you live. I think it's pretty much summer everywhere in the US at this point, right? We're well into June. We asked this question a couple of years ago on our Director's Cut Summer Shorts that we did, but it's never been a part of a regular Director's Cut. So you two are the lucky ones that get to answer this. And we'll uh, we'll start with Philip on this one. What's your favorite part about summer field work? Good question. So, Brad, we kind of talked about this beforehand. You, know, I started working for Galen Associates back when I was 14. When I was 18, they finally let me out into the field. And so I was doing concrete testing, uh, soils testing, all of the above. And my favorite part about that, honestly, was being the first person to raise their hand for 2 a.m. or 3 a.m. concrete pours. Like, I would just volunteer for them. I loved it because then, you know, by the time noon came around, I'm already well into overtime. And then I was like, oh, I can just sit in the lab and run Atterbergs and then go home and go to bed. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Elaine, what about you? Favorite part of summer summer field work? Is, is there any favorite part of summer field work? <laughs> that, I don't think there is a favorite part, especially in the heat of the day. Like Phil said, the best part is getting started early in the morning and bringing a lot of water. But uh, I, I don't know. I, I, I worry about my, my employees when they go out in the summer. Yeah. Uh, heat, heat strokes, heat they impact it's impacts integrity impacts your your mind impacts uh, your safety and safety is is paramount and uh so i i really worry about uh summer heat and uh anybody should do that really bring a lot of water cover put put suntan lotion on yourselves and uh so it's it's more of favorite and it's not a favorite it's it's more of a wor worrisome and just got to be prepared a lot more preparation in my opinion when you're working in the field during the summer I like that, though. We don't have enough safety minutes on uh, on director's cut. So thank you for that. Now, one of the questions we talked about this a little bit before we recorded, I'm always fascinated when we do these Father's Day or Mother's Day ones, because as I explained, I ran about as far away from from my dad's engineering discipline as I possibly could when I was a kid. But we have so many uh, fathers and sons, fathers and daughters, mothers and sons, whatever combos within GI, where they're obviously both civils and obviously both geotechs. So I want to know, when did each of you know that Philip would be a civil engineer? And Elaine, we'll start with you. Uh, I don't know. He knew when he, was, he wanted to be a civil engineer. All I know is that uh, he needed a summer job and it was 14, 15, and I, said, I, need, and I need some help in the lab. So I said, "Come on, boy, let's 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 go to the lab. We'll teach you some soil soil mechanics, uh, how to, how to run an Atterberg and uh, do a proctor and uh, do some of the basic uh, 
lab work. Uh, and then he did more than that, like that. And then again, got trained, got ACI certification for concrete and, and uh, went out to the field. And that was more of a summer job. He wanted money. After that, he went to, to college, went to Auburn. Uh, and uh, I, he'll tell the rest of the story. But that was a decision he had to make. I, 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 didn't, I didn't have anything to do with it. And I was kind of surprised, you know, after seeing all the pits, pitfalls and agonies and everything else that we went, I went through. Uh, why, why the, why the heck would you want to follow my footsteps? But, it, but it, it did. All right, now, Philip, you're going to walk us through that journey of all the engineering programs at Auburn now. Huh? <laughs> well. I want to, to go back on that, Brad, for a second, because I do remember, I think I was 17 years old. It was near Christmas time that my dad's lab finally got an auto hammer. And it was it was my Christmas present. I no longer had to do modified <laughs> proctors. It was amazing. So that was uh, that was awesome. Um, so, yeah, w- when I got into Auburn, I didn't want to be a civil engineer. You know, I'd already been doing it. Um, for you know my dad already kind of lived that i was like yeah i i I want to try electrical engineering uh and so when i got into electrical um i realized that i did not understand circuits they gave me nightmares i just could not wrap my head around them so then i switched to computer engineering and you still had to take circuits so i dropped out of that and i got into civil engineering because it's it's what i knew and then really the more i learned about it the more i actually liked the fact that I had some background in it, but also, I, you know, I kind of fell in love with it. So that's uh, it's kind of how it happened. So I guess my sophomore-ish year of college is when I when I knew I'd be a civil engineer. And then stuck around there to go to grad school, too. And maybe that's where we'll end up with this next question. The other <laughs> question that we ask everybody when they come on Director's Cut is, how did you first get involved in ASCE and GI? So, Philip, we're back to you on this one. I'm going to guess it has something to do with Auburn. It, it most definitely does. Yeah, so I was a part of the ASC really early, the Concrete Canoe Team. Um, just got involved in that was the captain of it, then co-captain of it, and even in graduate school kind of volunteered for the the concrete canoe side of running that program. So it was a it was a ton of fun. Um but getting into graduate school was actually from the concrete canoe team. So I didn't want to go to graduate school initially. It was uh kind of my senior year and the professor who was the head professor for the concrete canoe team pulled me aside and knew my background working for my dad. And he was like, hey, we have this uh, program, uh, it's self consolidated concrete in drilled shafts. We've already done all the prep work. The design's already done on the concrete, but we need to actually implement this. We're gonna do three test shafts out in the field, and then it's gonna go to a field program where they're actually gonna use this on a bridge, hopefully. And, you know, I really was like, I don't know, Dr. Schindler, maybe, I, I don't know. It's, well we'll pay you. What? Okay. Yeah, sure. Yeah, absolutely. Sign me up. (laughs) So it was all in all, it sounds like your involvement in civil and geotech was, was driven by the almighty buck here, but also (laughs) a love for the profession. I'm sure that's uh, absolutely. That was a lot of fun. What about the geotechnical profession is so so unique. When I got into the geotechnical field, actually, I went to I went to University of Florida. I went to the other orange and blue school, the real the real engineering school. I, Auburn is a great school, but <laughs> uh, let's not forget the UF. <laughs> anyway, when I went after going, I got my AA degree in mathematics, and then I went to Gainesville and then walked around and and was starting thinking. I said, I don't want to be a professor. What am I going to do with this degree? So I said, point me to the engineering degree, engineering department. So I went there and signed up, and then I started. I did everything, and that's actually was starting a major in structural engineering. I took all the structural engineering courses. And I went to the major professor. I said, well, this is kind of boring. And sooner or later, a computer is going to be doing everything on structure engineering. You put length and width, and everything is codes. Uh, you'll press a number. You'll give you your beam size and everything. I want, I want to go into the field where things change. So, oh, you want that. So I get down to the lab, get down in the basement, and uh, go into geotechnical engineering. Everything changes every day. 
Uh, and that's been cool for me because there is there's not a, bore, a boring day in geotechnical engineering because every every site is different, every application is different, every uh, you can go anywhere. They give you they teach you the basics, but then you can you have to apply that anywhere in the U.S. You know, it's interesting. People when I was doing work all over the U.S. I said, "What are you doing in uh, Virginia doing work?" Uh, you got your degree from Florida. I said, well, I got my degree in geotechnical engineering, teaching me how to handle the characteristics of soils. I can go in your USA, take a sample of the soil, evaluate it, and apply my knowledge to solve a problem in Virginia. Local tech practice is, yes, it's good. You need to be talking to local practitioners in terms of if there's unique practices in there, but the basic elements is go, carries all over the world. It's geotechnical practice, so it's it's been pretty... That's that's why I got into the geotechnical. Anyway, answering your question about ASCE, God, it was the first year, 1972, I think I joined I joined uh, ASCE, and uh, we had a very active group. We would do uh, uh, shows. I remember doing. We would do puppet shows for kids uh, on the weekends. We had a team of puppeteers. We cre we built a a stage, and we would go to kids' birthday parties and do puppet shows. As I, I, it was part of the practice, so yeah, it was our group at ASCE. That was kind of our little uh, outreach thing that we did. But that was one of the things. It was, it was a lot of fun, and I've been a, is, a member of ASCE ever since. I'm, I think I'm a life life member right now. That is fantastic. That is the first time on Director's Cut. I said before we're <laughs> we're on like 178 or something. Nobody's ever brought up puppet shows before. I love that. <laughs> And I also love that right over your right shoulder back there on that bookcase, I do see an ASCE plaque or something. We love that when those appear in the background because it makes us seem a little more legit and earnest about actually asking that question when we do. Oh, that it's was really good. It, it's not planted. I, I didn't know it was there. Yeah, it is there. <laughs> <laughs> Philip, we got to go back to you for another Auburn question now. And, sure. you know, as I said, Director's Cut always comes back to food, sports, and music. At some point here, we're going to talk sports for a minute. You spent several years at Auburn getting a couple degrees. What are your top three Auburn sports memories? Top three Auburn sports memories. So, uh, yeah, I was there at the time of Carlos Dansby and uh, Calic Williams. So lots of fun there. Jason Campbell is a quarterback. Um, so that was those were good years. Um, undergrad, we were undefeated uh, against Alabama, which was a really nice thing to hang over that. Uh, not so much anymore. Um, <laughs> So my favorite memory. So first thing I think when you think of sports wise, I somehow got looped into the light crew at the Coliseum. So every gymnastics event, basketball events, um, God, there must have been at least one more, but it was at least those two. We got to do the lights for it. And so me and a couple guys, and that was just so much fun. Uh, and that was the old Coliseum before they got their new their new system there, um, which I'm sure is all automated now. They don't have a light crew. Um, the other favorite memory I have is probably after what we talked about before, after Hurricane Ivan came through. So they canceled or delayed the Auburn versus LSU game. And my dad had a sailboat down in Pensacola that, uh, you know, Pensacola got completely wrecked. And so we weren't even sure where the boat was. You know, we knew it wasn't in the dock anymore. And so we all hopped in a car. I met them all over in Montgomery. We drove down and pretty much camped down there at, uh, Dad, it was your office, your Pensacola office, right? Yeah. We were there, and then the front wall of the building wasn't even there anymore. It kind of got blown onto wow. a pickup truck. The uh, back door wasn't there either. We were, we were... That's right. <laughs> um so we were down there, we were cleaning up some stuff. We found the boat. Um, it was it was crazy. Then I was driving back from that. I couldn't tell you how long we were down there, but I know we were driving back and I was listening to the Auburn LSU game. It probably um, at some point started up there, but I was listening to it and it was towards the end of the game that I was pulling into my trailer. And I turned the game on to the TV, kind of running in as Auburn was on their fourth down, probably 11 yards to go 
uh, and it just would have would have sold the game. You know, it would would have been the game running, and it was a pass hit the guy in the gut. He drops down. Auburn gets the first down. Game's over, and I was probably about a mile and a half from the stadium where the trailer park was, and you could hear the rumbling from that stadium from our house. It was so cool. So that was that was a really neat uh, neat time to be there. Now, when you were working on the lights at the Coliseum, I mean, I think this is one of the amazing things I love about being that age. Were you nervous at all about doing that or did it just seem like a cool thing to do? Because, you know, I would imagine for basketball, there are some games where there are 13,000 people in there. And if you screwed up, everybody in that building would know it. But I think you have this like fearlessness when you're that age that you don't realize like how big of a deal it is. Yeah, I think that's right. But also, it, what are you going to screw up? <laughs> well, that's, I mean, there is it's, that. It's a giant spotlight and you just need to, you know, just, and they tell you what to do with it. And I go, oh, okay, cool. Um, but yeah, I think that's right. You know, you're, you, you, you do get to a point where you're like, you're going to trust me with this. And I trust myself. Sure. Absolutely. <laughs> oh, I love that. Alain, we got to ask you, too. You brought this up earlier. You ran your own firm for many, many, many years, and then you were acquired by Terracon, I think you said in 2019. What was the hardest part of of being acquired by Terracon? You can also give us the best part if you want, but I want to know what was the most challenging thing for you? Uh, yeah, after 20 years, we're in a business for 20 years, 2009 to 2019, and uh, it was a great time. Uh, and Terracon approached me. They were in a move. They were moving toward the southeast. They had no no presence in the, in the southeast, and they really wanted to come to the southeast. We had at the time, I don't know, eight offices in the southeast. We had basically Chattanooga, Jackson, uh, Chattanooga, Memphis, Jackson, uh, Pensacola, Atlanta, and Birmingham, and Oxford, and Huntsville. That was kind kind of all all. Uh, network about 250 mile radius from uh birmingham is really what my that was my 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 goal i want to be able to get to the mm-hmm. office within four hours uh without any problems and i had worked with them before matter of fact my youngest brother he's also a geotechnical engineer andre had worked with me when i first started the company and his wife was from city rapids iowa but after a year or so with me, she wanted to go home. And so he, he decided, they decided to move to Cedar Rapids and join Terracon. So he had been with Terracon uh, for a while. And as, as I mentioned earlier, I do a, a lot of national, I've got a lot of national clients that we did a lot of shopping centers all over the country. And I use their network of offices to help me get the work done, get some of the field work done. Uh, so I knew them and uh, the, they are, their mentality, their their procedures, they they were very very good, great great group to work with. So when they approached me, uh, I said, well, I was at the point like, starting to sell my company internally with to the employees. I had gone through a, an evaluation. Uh, I had hired somebody to give me an evaluation of the company to help me price the stocks internally, so I could start selling it to the employees, so I could start going through a transition. So I had a pretty fresh uh, evaluation package put together. So they asked me when they came up and that they were interested in me. I said, okay, well, here's what I've just done to the company. This is the valuation of the firm. Uh, this is what I'm using for my employees. It's, and inside of there, there is an external valuation pricing. If you take a look at it and see what you think. They came back within a week or two and says, you know, we, we agree with it. So we we have no problem with it. So if, you, if you're interested, we... We'll go, we'll go. So that's how I pr- transitioned. At the same time, they were buying two other firms in the Southeast. It was interesting because all three of the f- owners got together and, and met each other at, at a gathering, which is, that was kind of interesting. The first time they've done that before. Now, what was the, the negative thing? The negative thing is losing the control. Uh, I tried to get on the board, but they have policies on who gets on the board. So I, I couldn't. But then they wanted me to manage the office, but without having full control, I couldn't do that. I said, no, I don't want to do that. You you can use what my operation manager, he can run the office. That's what he's been doing for me, Let him, but I'm not, give me something else. And that's where I picked uh, the 
energy sector to help them promote that because at the time the energy their work in energy was very very low uh, and we had we had a lot of work to get there we again a lot of it had to do with uh, safety protocols and everything that we had to build in with intercon so that's uh so the net most negative probably was uh, losing the control uh day-to-day -day control but again it became an, a, a positive and once i got a hold of that and say okay fine i don't need to deal with that that's you know in running a business the hardest part is, is people anyway the technical part is a piece of cake the the hardest part is is is, is uh satisfying people and my wife was really helping me on the hr side during on a business so take the hr out let me do something technical let me do something new and that's what i did so it's worked out okay that's fantastic you answered all the follow-up questions i was going to ask <laughs> because i think yeah it's the administrative side is really it's not the, even that it's hard for a lot of people but it's not as enjoyable i think for a lot of people right like you you figure out how to do it and you muddle through but it's not as much fun that's yeah there's another book you know i have a entrepreneur roundtable we had i had in birmingham which was a group of uh, we had about 15 of us owners and we got together once a month and talk about issues and you know and we all say you know there's no book to be a pres president of a company there because every issue comes up is a, a new issue to to you anyway but it's not an issue to the industry so i we use that group we would meet there every month and we have what's your number five, what's your highest requirement and we'll put five points on that and on your lowest ones so we'll go around the table and then we'll hit all the five and we'll put it on the table if it's an issue and then you you have all the other owners basically being your, like your outside board and they basically say yeah i've been there i've done that this is what i did and this is what you need to do and this is what so you that was really my my feedback because when you're running a company uh a lot of things are new uh, to you anyway. They might not be out there, but when you're trying to make a decision uh, for an issue that's on your table or in front of you on a particular day, uh, there's not a book that you can go and turn to page 163 and uh, look on paragraph four yeah. and say, this is, the, this is the equation for that solution. I like that a lot. We're, we have two questions left. They're both, we'll call them special Father's Day questions that we threw in here at the end. Elaine, we're going to start with you on the second to last one here. You can both jump in. We, After Philip was the lab guru in his teen <laughs> years, have you two ever worked on a project together and what was it like? I don't know if we worked. On, we've consulted with each other many, many, many yeah, times over, over the years. Uh, him in, going into the, the construction industry and myself. So we've consulted. I've used this, him as a reference or as a resource on, on some deep foundation issues or some uh, uh, practical construction side issues. He's called me and, and picked my brain on some theoretical and, and technical issues. So we've consulted in a number of projects back and forth. But to work on one particular project or another, I don't think we've done that. No, I don't think we have. No, I remember distinctly, actually, there was probably one month, this was, this was a couple of years back ago, that I had an argument with structural engineers, four different structural engineers, or maybe three different structural engineers, three different times, three different job sites about putting a foundation, like a deep foundation, under a swimming pool. Um, and it was like, no, no, effective stress, guys. You're, you're removing the soil, water weighs half as much as the soil, and they were just pushing back and pushing back and finally i called my dex so like am i losing my mind here like i, I know i'm pretty sure i'm right and he was like oh no no you're right they're wrong it's fine so, okay good an <laughs> argument with that doesn't happen does it <laughs> <laughs> the, but i i do have to ask you guys so for the rest of the family like at thanksgiving or at a summer barbecue or whatever when the conversation inevitably turns to to engineering or to projects or whatever, does everybody else get annoyed? How do they deal with the two of you? Do they just kind of let you go do your own thing? Our conversation is kind of subtle on the side, Flip, flipping burgers. <laughs> you know, hey, yeah. I, what what do you what do you think of that? Oh, what do you think? It's not something that paralyzes the the entire conversation <laughs> at the table. That's great, you guys. Well done. I'm proud of you because that's uh, <laughs> well, so growing up, Brad, we, 
you know, my parents were running the company. So it was 89 to, to 2009. So I mean, I literally grew up as the you know, five-year-old there and my sisters and stuff. And we would just hear the complaints about the company over dinner time all of the time. And so I think just, you know, business talk is not, not that uncommon. <laughs> I think, yeah, anybody who's been involved in a small business in their life or <laughs> you get used to it, right? Yeah. So the final question we have for the two of you, and I, I, I don't know who we'll start with on this one. Maybe we'll start with Philip on this one. The way I wrote it was, what trait are you proudest, proudest to inherited, to have inherited or passed on uh, here? So Philip, for you, what trait are you proudest to have inherited from your dad? So when you sent out this list of questions, I was going over it with my wife, Brad. And she started laughing when I went over this question. So, so this is from from her. She says the ability to talk to anybody and not even know who their their name. So it's happened multiple. I've I've been around where it happened multiple times with my dad and my mom go up to him like, man, who was that guy? Said, I have no clue. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So I'd say, um, yeah, the gift of sales. I mean, he, dad, you're you know, a great salesman and the kind of. I, I've been trying to pick up the tidbits of different stuff from them. And uh, yeah, that's uh, that's my answer. Alan, what about you? What what are you proudest to have passed on to Philip? Well, his integrity and his, his confidence and his uh, self-awareness and the way he can communicate uh, clearly to, to people. I'm, I'm extremely proud of the way what he's been doing. It's just uh, it's amazing. Great job, Philip. Nice that. Guys, that was fantastic. And that's why we do these special Father's Day episodes of Director's Cut. You made it through all 10 questions. I always <laughs> tell everybody that's an accomplishment, even if it's happened a hundred and what did we say? 177 times before. Still something you can be proud of. For our viewers, if you liked what you saw, and I always say you're here at the end, so you probably did. Click like, subscribe, and get notifications, and we'll let you know every time we post something to the YouTube channel. So, Alain, Philip, thank you guys for doing this. I, ho I hope it was a lot of fun. Yeah, thanks, Brad. Brad. Appreciate it. Yeah. Yeah, thank you so much. Thanks for setting this up. I always yeah. dread the day when somebody says, nah, you know, this wasn't a very good time. <laughs> well, you know, I, the, just just the advice. What, what the heck do I want to sit down and listen and question, make questions? Make a fool out of myself. Anyway, that's but it was you did a good great. job, Brad. And again, for all the viewers out there, this was a special Father's Day Director's Cut. That's why you're seeing this on a Friday and not on a typical Wednesday like you always see us. But we will be back with our final two episodes of the spring season in the next two weeks. So tune in in five days instead of seven for a brand new episode of Director's Cut.